Uh, as mentioned, I will be discussing today about the Willow Valley Railway. Um, with that, you might notice it's kind of a weird name for a place of Tooele. Um, if you want to say it like a local does, you got to say it kind of like Tooele or something like that. Not Tooele. Yeah, not Tooele. I've, I've made that correction a few times before and you want to say it right. Um, for those of you who don't know, Tooele is a small town that is to the west out here um, on the benches of the Ochre Mountains. Um, so we would. So Tooele is about south of where the Western Pacific Main Line and I-80 ran through. Um, a little bit about myself. I am a member of the Tooele City Preservation Commission. Um, you might notice I'm kind of young for being a fan of a railroad that stopped existing several years before I was born. So um, I am a big. I'm not a professional on this subject, but I know a lot of it through research and it's a hobby. It's a very big hobby. And I have this picture of our family at the Railroad Museum in the 1990s. Um, that's me in the yellow shirt as a kid. So um, that's pretty much, that kind of shows you how long my interest in this line has gone back because it's, it's, I, I've been interested in this for a long time. So to kind of get a bearing of what the Tool Valley, why, why it was built in the first place, we kind of need to take a step back into the mining history um, in Utah. One of our, the mining boom in Utah really began around 1848 or so, when a group of soldiers, the Stockton California Regiment, I can't remember their exact numbers, but they were led by Colonel Patrick Connor. They were basically sent to Utah to sit around during the Civil War. They, they weren't happy. They wanted to be in the Civil War. They didn't want to be out here in the middle of nowhere far away from the conflict. So to keep themselves busy, they started prospecting for metals. And um, so yeah, anyway, so with the metal prospecting, a lot of mining camps started popping up in um, Utah. These, this is a list kind of just specific on the Ochre Mountain Range itself. There were other areas such as the Tintic Mining Range and Park City had mines, and they really made this push in the in the 1800s to start, you know, opening up all these new mining camps. And the Ochre Mountains was really one of the hotbeds for it. And of course, um, if you're going to be um, mining a lot of stuff, you got to be processing what you mine. So a lot of smelters began to open up, especially in the Salt Lake Valley. For a time, I think. The Salt Lake Valley might have had one of the highest numbers, concentrations of like lead and copper smelters in the entire United States. Um, here's a few of the different smelters that um, equipment that was in the region. Um, this building is still standing. They're kind of slowly demolishing it. Um, it's down in Murray, just to the south of us, by the big hospital there. Um, this building is, um, these are the ruins in the Tintic Mining District of another one of the smelters that was down there, sort of the foundation, what's left of it. And this here, if, you know, if you guys came in on I-80, you drove past this site. This is where Kennecott Rio Tinto smelter still is, so, you know, it's the big smokestack when you just look out to the west here. And this was what the facility looked like when it was built, originally built in the early 1900s. However, there was a bit of a problem with all of these smelters in one place. The air was kind of nasty. <laughs> um, a, you know, Salt Lake City, most of the people living in the valley were descendants from the original generation of Mormon pioneers. Agrarian lifestyle, farmers, ranchers, orchards, and that kind of stuff. And as you can imagine, having these smelters spewing lead and arsenic and cadmium and all that kind of stuff into the air, wasn't good on the crops. And um, there ended up being a couple lawsuits in be between um, McCleary versus Highland Boy was one in 1904, and then Godfrey versus Asarco in 1905. And the courts ended up si siding with the farmers in it because their crops were being killed by all these smelting operations. The larger smelting companies like Asarco and United States Smelting and Refining, I think was their name, they were able to remain open because they could had enough money to settle, they could install some technology to keep the pollution down a bit. 
But all the smaller smelter companies started closing down. They couldn't continue operating with the legal litigation that was coming up against them. So with that, they had to find a new smelting site, one in particular that was close to the Ochre Mountains, where they could process a lot of the ore that was coming out of places such as the Bingham Canyon. Um, and this here, this is in downtown, um, just suburban Murray. This is where the Highland Boy smelter used to be, just big empty field now. Kind of funny that there's this whole suburbia around it, but that is one of the locations that used to have one of these smelters in Salt Lake. Kind of gives a good idea of how close these smelters were to the farms and the communities that were in the area. So um, around, you know, after those small smelters closed, a lot of them banded up together. They sort of got in a group. They got together with um, Anaconda Copper was one of the sponsors who was pushing to get a smelter in there because they wanted to compete with um, Asarco and some of the other big companies in the area. So they ended up looking for a new smelter site. Um, John D. Ryan, he was one of the investors from Anaconda who was helping this push to get a smelter built, and, one of the, and Tooele became an obvious location because it was close to the mines in the Ochre Mountains, but it was also, you know, it was far enough away from the more populated Salt Lake Valley that they weren't going to get sued by the farmers pretty much. So during 1907 through 1908 is when they began buying up the land that they were going to put the smelter on. Um, and then in 1908 is when the railway, the Tool Valley Railway, was chartered for this new smelter. And then the new smelting company, the International Smelting and Refining Company, was founded in December. So pretty much as soon as, as, soon as the two companies were founded, construction started right away. Um, the guy who was the first president of the Tool Valley Railway, it's sort of funny. Um, I, I did a Google search, you know, trying to find images for this presentation and th this was the guy was the first president of the railway it's an editorial cartoon <laughs> and I, I don't know if you can see well from the back but in his hands he has like four copper ingots ingots that he's just walking around with so I love this image of this man in a suit just copper ingots in hand just <laughs> marching around um, so construction on the Tooele Valley Railway started right away um, in the night by December 1908. To give you a bit of a sense of the ge geography and geology of the area, the smelter site was being built on the eastern edge of town. Um, and that area would become known as International, named after the company itself. And then from Tooele to the western end of town where the Los Angeles and Salt Lake main line was, um, on the west end, they ended up naming the area Warner. So that's where the name Warner Branch came from. It was actually one of the construction foremen who, and maintenance away foremen on the Tooele Valley Railway's name was Warner. So the branch and the location where the interchange happened would be named after him. And um, because it was running through the middle of the town, they ran up and down Vine Street, which was the main east-west thoroughfare through town. So you can see it's a dirt road at this point of time when the photo was taken, but you can see one side of the road there, one side there, and the tracks just being plopped right in the middle of it. Um, here's the construction of the bridge which crossed Middle Canyon, which was the, right outside of the eastern end of town before they got up to the smelter site. They pre-built the bridge with the pilings just laid up all along here. And then they had the steam crane coming through and they'd lift the pilings up. They'd mount the pilings and then they'd pull up the next segment and lay the rail and just, they sort of did that until they got to the opposite end of the gorge. Um, the railway officially opened in April of 1909. They had to, I think the first locomotive to run on it, they leased from the Los Angeles and Salt Lake Railroad since Tooele didn't have any of its own locomotives. Um, due to the location of the smelter, it's on the, being on the bench of the mountain, it was pretty much as the crow flies, very close to the Bingham Mining District, which is where the Kennecott Copper Pit is nowadays. So what they did is they built this tramway, which was a cable car system that would go up and down from the Copper Pit down to the smelter. So pretty much a lot of the ore that was coming from Bingham was coming in from that tramway. 
So the Tool Valley Railway's main purpose, at least in this time, wasn't necessarily hauling ore, other than the occasional custom load coming from off-site that wasn't in the Bingham area. But it was more hauling the flux, which is limestone used in the smelter process, um, coal, coke, and then it was hauling the outbound ingots that were cast uh, at, up at the smelter. And then in July 1910, that's when the smelter itself opened. Um, one of the very wise decisions they made after building the smelter, the original focus of the international smelting was on copper. But by 1912, they finished building a, an extension, which was for lead. Um, sort of a prudent decision that would keep them in business another 30, 40 years longer than had they just built the copper segment. Um, by 1914, the company was officially brought in to be part of the larger Anaconda Copper Company. International Wood kind of continued to operate semi-independently, although from what I can tell by 1914, Anaconda was pretty much the parent at that point. So most of the steam locomotives on the Tooele Valley Railway were second-hand. Um, I don't think they bought any of them new. They, they didn't, you know, they didn't go to Alco or Baldwin and place a new order. They'd either buy it used from another railroad or they'd go to Alco and be like, what do you have in your overstock aisle, pretty much. So, and so, sort of a motley collection of engines here. This is number three, I think. I want to say this was the Lions 060. It's a former Great Northern engine that came from the Butte Anaconda mining properties that you know, used on the Great Northern, went to Butte, and then Butte sort of bounced it down to Tooele when operations started up here. Uh, there's also on the, there's some records saying there was a 262 tank engine. Um, some rumors that it's in Mexico. There's a whole section on Utah Rails about that, and it's really hard to tell what's up with that 262 since the records aren't really very clear back in the early 1900s. They also had a, this, this is the, here's another picture of the 060 switcher here. Um, and, and then they also have two, a Mogul, a 260, which was another former Great Northern locomotive that had come down from Butte. Then one of the, and then they had a few motor cars, which they were using to, you know, get passengers and people up and down the line. Yeah, here's a picture of the 260 here. And this is one of the little tiny speeders that they had. They had a bigger one that was, um, they ended up converting into a caboose. But this was one of the small ones. Now, due to the heavy traffic that was on the Tula Valley Railway, they had a lot of passenger commuter trains for the work shifts coming up to the smelter. And then, of course, they were hauling things like ore and coal, which are very heavy loads. So ultimately, the most successful type of locomotive they decided on, which they used for most of the line's um, history, were the 280 consolidations. The first two to arrive on property were number 11, which is the one in the museum today, and number 12. Um, and then they ended up getting from Butte Anaconda Pacific, they got second hand number 10 and then number 9 in the preceding years. Um, 11 and 10 were sort of the line's road engines. Like, all of them had pretty similar specifications, similar boil, boiler sizes, 51 inch drivers, but 11 and 10 had the you know box, boxier tender shape, while 9 and 10 had sloped back tenders and old Stefferson style valve gear. So they were a little bit older, and they, although they were built around the same time as 11 and 12 were, they were older and a little bit s slower engines, I guess you could say, by, just by design. Um, here's one good shot taken in the 1940s, I think, which shows all four of the line's consolidation locomotives. Um, this wasn't very common to see four engines on point on the Tooele Valley Railway. Because of the steep grades coming out of town and the street running part, they actually pushed the majority of the trains. So the locomotive would be on the back end of the train, and a brakeman would be up in the caboose on the front with the horn. And he'd be watching the street, and he'd be blowing the horn, at any car that got in their way while they were going up and down the street running segment. Here's some guys um, working in the cab of number nine. So the Western Pacific Railway entered the story in 1917. Um, as I mentioned, originally built the Tula Valley Railway only connected with the Los Angeles and Salt Lake, which later became Union Pacific. 
But in the Western Pacific, I, I think you guys could know the history better than I do about the whole bankruptcies and all that kind of stuff. But once everything was stable there, they were able to build that Warner Branch Line, which hooked down from the Western Pacific at Burmester and went down south to the, to the Tooele Valley Railway at Warner. Um, the Western Pacific actually had a few limestone quarries, which provided the flux, which the Tooele Smelter would use for the majority of its life. Um, as I mentioned already, the Tool Valley ran a lot of commuter trains, so every shift change at the smelter would have one or two commuter trains that were basically passenger cars to get people to and from work. Ores, coal, coke, flux, and then the Tool Valley Railway being a common carrier, and they built a team track. So this um, side of the museum was sort of a team track. There was a lumber yard, a few fuel depots, and they were bringing in all sorts of random things for the city. Um, one of my favorite, um, I've seen a picture of a waybill from like the 1960s. The local high school was rebuilding, a, it was building a new auditorium, and they placed an order for the chairs for the auditorium to be delivered at the Tool Valley Railway Depot. So they brought these, like a load of 100 high school chairs for this, for this auditorium stage building, which they all unloaded here. Um, the freight that was coming out of the Tooele Valley Railway, um, you know, as I said, inbound stuff was ore and coal and a lot of it coming from the western region, so western Pacific, Rio Grande, Union Pacific, southern Pacific. The outbound freight, though, was mostly going back east. Anaconda and International owned a copper refinery in Raritan, New Jersey. Um, right by the, almost by the Atlantic Ocean pretty much. Like you can see New York City from Raritan. And then um, they also owned a lead, a lead refinery in um, East Chicago, Indiana. And this is a photo of their East Chicago plant. So, you know, you'd bring in the box cars from Tooele and unload them and um, take all the lead and gets to be processed into the final product there. Here's a few other pictures of the early years on the railway. This is the machine shop locomotive complex. Um, another, here's an early picture with one of the consolidations, probably 10, nine or 10, I think. And it's you can kind of tell it's an older picture because the headlight is mounted on the top of the smoke box and not in the center like it would be in the later years on the line. One of the interesting things, having a big smelter, a big industry in Tooele, was it changed the cultural identity. A lot of the, you know, Tooele was originally built, settled by Mormon pioneers, and when they ended up bringing a smelter in, they had a lot of immigrants coming from Eastern Europe, so Tooele had a lot of Greek, a lot of Czech um, immigrants, um, just uh, Italians, um, they also had some people coming in from Asia, so Twill actually had a Japanese colony that was northeast out of town where a, a lot of the Japanese people settled sort of their own small community. And due to this, they, you know, due to this expansion of new people and new differences, new beliefs, um, they ended up building sort of a separate side of town which is called Newtown. So there, Twill had the main street which was sort of the old Mormon side of town, and then Newtown which is the Greek and the Czech and the Eastern European people were living there. And sort of this de facto segregation existed in the city until most people credit the town really coming together. I mean, if you're looking for like some sports movie idea, like, like imagine, imagine like remember the Titans but in the early 1900s instead. Um, they um, had this guy named Sterling Harris. He was a high school football and basketball coach, I want to say. He, um, he, you know, he, 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 he was born in Mexico, raised in Canada, living in Tooele. He'd been all over North America himself, and he went and he sort of invited the people from both sides of town, from the old side, the Mormon pioneer side of town, and the new Czech and the Greek immigrants to all play on the football and basketball teams together. And the first state football championship for the local high school was his team. So. He's sort of remembered as being one of the guys who helped bring the town together from that de facto segregation that was beginning to happen due to two separate neighborhoods and two separate identities in town. Um, during the steam age, the world wars kept things very busy. 
even during the depression, there wasn't really a drop in traffic or demand for the smelter. In fact, a lot of people during the depression years would go up to the smelter and line up outside, and they'd wait to see if they could pick up a swing shift or something if someone got injured or someone called in sick. They could see if they could just walk in and work a job there. Um, the railroad was a 24-7 operation during this age. Trains up and down the line all day, every day, steam trains through Vine Street, so all the people who had houses next to the railroad tracks would have a parade of steam all day, every day. There's a rumor that when they built the line, Anaconda International told Tooele, we're going to electrify this like we did in Butte. They never did. It was steam and diesel all the way throughout. Never electrified, never got the quiet electrics and cleaner stuff, just <coughs> steam. Um, as things got busier on the line, the 260 and the 060 from earlier were eventually retired in the 1920s because they're just too small. They couldn't keep up with how busy this little six mile long freight line was. Um, a lot of the Tool Valley Railway's um, accidents and incidents were due to snow and ice. There's a few pictures in the museum collection from the 1930s and the 1940s. Um, I, I think this set is from the 1940s. Um, you can see the snow going up to the cab of the engine here. The, that's Marion Bevan, who was one of the engineers on the line. He's sort of, he, he was stuck in that cab for like two or three, he was in there for several days trying to keep the engine in steam, keeping it you know, running while they were waiting to dig him out, basically. So he, that's sort of him probably giving a nice awkward smile, like, I'm having fun, but I've been in this engine for like three days now. <laughs> like it's, it, it was a, the, the, there's a picture I couldn't find in the museum archives, but and there was an accident on the line where an engine hit ice on the road in Vine Street, in the street running part of town. You know, some automobile drove over onto the tracks because the tracks were clear and the road was, it been packed down ice in between the flanges of the rails. Train comes through and bounces. Like it looks like the model railroad type of crash. Like no injuries, no one died fortunately, but the train is on its side. You can see its wheels and the coal from the tender just splattered everywhere. And that was number 12 involved in that accident. 12 had another incident, which we'll get to later in these photos. So, as I said, trains were usually ran short. The four locomotive thing that I showed you earlier was rare. Most trains were six to 10, maybe 14 cars of coal, ore, and flux and box cars that they push up the hill because street running and then a 2% something grade, it would be a pretty bad disaster if a car broke loose and on that grade and ran down the hill. So that's why they pushed and set up pole trains because they were afraid. They did not want to see a random freight car flying down downtown through the middle of the street. Um, that derailment I mentioned from the ice happened in 1933. Um, here's number 12 again. Um, this was a fire that occurred during the start of World War II at the smelter. Um, 1942, I think that was when World War II started. Someone can correct me on that. But um, yeah, number 12 was in the engine shop undergoing one of its rebuilds, and this whole thing went on flames. And they put the engine back <coughs> in service. Um, but as you can see, the entire engine shop was trashed by this fire, and half of the west end of the smelter and railroad complex were really damaged by this. And being in war, wartime production, they really had no other option to just build it back up again and get back to work. Um, this is one of uh, this is a cool picture. It's one of the commuter um, passenger trains. This is number eleven. It's the train that is in our museum in Tula today. Um, number three, this is the caboose that is still behind the train in the museum, which is kind of nice. And then we have these four passenger cars. Um, this building here was the Tula City um, and County Courthouse building. It's actually sort of our museum friends down the street there. The Tula City Pioneer Museum occupies this building nowadays. And um, pretty much Main Street, the downtown main thoroughfare, which is SR36 nowadays, is just right about where the tail end of this train is going through. One of the plans that was devised sort of towards the end of the steam age on the railroad was to replace that aerial tramway with a dedicated underground um, narrow gauge network to pull ore from the mines directly in the Bingham Canyon underground to Tooele. And this ended up becoming known as the Elton Tunnel. 
Um, it was named after J. O. Elton, who was the manager of the Tula Smelter at the time the plan was proposed. And the Tula Valley ended up building its one and only branch line to go from the, from the main line, the six mile long main line, up to the tunnel site. So this little two mile diversion. The grade is actually still visible. You can kind of see some of the ties still buried in the dirt up there. It's kind of nice, a nice little walk because you can see all the gray intact leading up to this tunnel. Um, when the tunnel opened in the 1940s, big fanfare. They had a celebration. They called it Tunnel Days. They had people out there with bands and you know people giving speeches about how important the tunnel was going to be this big economic mover for the city. They brought in a lot of copper through the tunnel. They um, wanted to use it for irrigation too, but that didn't really work out because nasty mine water, again, is not good for crops. Um, and because this tunnel was supposed to be this big, huge thing that was going to change everything on the railroad, they actually stopped running passenger trains. They retained the commuter trains for the smelter shift workers, but the general public couldn't get on a passenger train anymore. Like, you had to be going to work at the smelter if you wanted to ride the passenger train. Um, also, because of the tunnel, they had a lot of rocks lying around, so a few years later, they went back to the Middle Canyon Trestle, that wooden bridge, and they just started dumping the rocks and they backfilled it and made, a, they made an earthen dam to replace what the wooden bridge originally was. Um, after World War II, though, things sort of, World War II was kind of the turning point where things started to begin going downhill for the international Tooele operation because War's over, you don't need copper for electronics in the war anymore, you don't need lead for bullets anymore. So the market took a big slump. And one of the, a lot of the competitors that the tool had, such as the smelter in Murray, closed down. Um, the Tooele, in 1946, they shut down the copper division in Tooele. So as I mentioned earlier, the lead smelter was a very good choice for them because had they not installed the lead smelter, everything would have shut down in 46 and that would have been the end of it. Um, another thing that happened in 46 is they finally dropped the commuter trains. They, they figured everyone had automobiles and if not they could take a bus by then. So you, we can really see the effects of post-war modernization beginning to take a change and change how the railroad operated. Um, the tunnel in 1947, um, the Elton Tunnel, this big thing that was supposed to be this economic boom that was going to last 50 years or something, shut down after six years because of that copper market really being depressed and dropping down. Of course, with the post-war, another big thing that happened was people began looking and, you know, diesel technology came on the scene. And the Tool Valley Railway, like a lot of other railroads at the time, was looking into the diesel technology. One of the first engines they got was, that, that they tested, they didn't buy it, but they tested it, was a Baldwin DRS-64-1500 diesel. Um, I, this went on a national tour, so I think it ran on the Southern Pacific and Western Pacific before it came to Tooele. They ran it up and down Tooele. I guess Tooele didn't decide they wanted it, and instead Kennecott Copper, the company from the other side of the mountain, came down and bought it. So this ended up staying in Utah working for Kennecott, but Tooele remained a steam railroad at the time. I guess they weren't impressed with it or something. Um, the first of the four consolidations was scrapped in 1950. That was number nine, one of the um, Stepherson valve gear design ones. This is kind of a cool picture. I, this isn't exactly the best angle, but in 1955, steam was really, you know, they were getting rid of, they were retiring most of the steam engines on, at, in Tooele. Number 11 was really the last one still running by this point. So they brought Western Pacific, brought out um, one of its Bud RDC cars that used on the Zephyret. So they um, coupled it up here. You can see the RDC car there, the number 11 right behind it. And they ran it up and down, up and down the streets of Tooele, pretty much. And that was the last passenger train to ever run on the Tooele Valley Railway. And also, it was the only time Western Pacific that we know of sent a passenger car or pa you know passenger locomotive down to Tooele, down the Warner Branch and into town. Um, shortly after that, engine number ten was scrapped, sort of clearing up the engine house for a brand new diesel Tooele Valley number one hundred.
which was an SW-1200 built in 1955. It was the only locomotive that Tula Valley ever ordered directly from the factory. So they, they ordered it from EMD, placed a brand new order, and it came in and it showed up in May, and that was sort of the end of the majority of steam operations in Tooele. The diesel locomotive could pull longer trains. Without the passenger trains, the railroad wasn't quite as busy anyway, so they didn't need as many locomotives hauling so, so much stuff, so they sort of reduced to a two locomotive line, which was number 11, the steam locomotive on standby, and number 100 as the primary diesel locomotive running the line. This is sort of, um, this is sort of a color picture, shows you a good look at what the Tool Valley paint scheme looked like. Um, I think EMD came up with this paint scheme when they sold this new locomotive to Tooele. Um, in 1912, um, 1956, I mean, they retired number 12 in May, so number 12 didn't last that long. Um, let's see. <clears throat> With only the lead smelter and no more copper smelter and no more um, passenger trains, the yeah. railroad's work shift was reduced to a daily and not 24-7 operation. Um, they'd run at least two trains a day to keep up with the freight traffic coming in and out of the line. Um, the Tool Valley didn't own a full diesel inspection shop for the new diesel they bought since it was a steam era shop. So the diesel would actually be sent by the Union Pacific into Salt Lake City where they'd do the inspection there. And while the diesel was in Salt Lake was when they'd fire up the steam engine again and run the railroad on just the one steam engine. Um, here's a good picture of what the Union Pacific and Western Pacific operations look like in the area. Um, the Western Pacific had to build a horseshoe which um, crossed over the Union Pacific tracks. And there's a picture of that later on down here. Here we go. So yeah, this is the Warner Station. This was the Western Interchange for the Tool Valley Railway. A good nice shot of one of those big UP um, Centennial locomotives coming through. And then this is the Western Pacific's branch line here. And they had a cross above the Union Pacific line. You can see the Union Pacific station just right about there. And the Western Pacific came down and looped back over to hook up into the Tool Valley Railway. So May 20th, 1963, the boiler certificate on number 11 was about to expire. So they decided to formally um, retire the locomotive. When they did that, they ran it um, on the front end of a train with just like five or six ore cars up Vine Street and back up to the smelter. And then after they retired it, they placed it in a local city park um, down by, um, if you know Tula, the city park was by where the swimming pool and high school are. It was on, it was on Main, was it Main Street? Is that the one that went up? Vine Street. Vine Street. Yeah. The park yeah. was on Vine Street though. Yeah. Right below the crossing with Main Street. Yeah, it was, it was, down, it was just down the street from me. Um, 1960, so 1964, 11 was put as a static display in the park. 1966, when the Pickering Lumber Company closed down in California, the Tula Valley bought one of their SW900 engines, and that became the second diesel that was on the line. This is number 11, as she looked like um, in her park display. The, you, you, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with sort of the sad side of the steam engine in this little tiny box fence in a city park. And this is, and um, during that time, the, there was a big interest in starting a tourist railroad up in Heber on the former Denver Rio Grande Heber branch line. So the people from the new Heber Creeper operation came down to Tooele and like, well, we'd like to have your number 11 locomotive. And the people in Tula said, no, we don't want to give it up. We're too proud of our town. We don't want to let it go out of town. So Heber went to the state and picked up um, Union Pacific 618 instead. And that's, you, I'm sure if you've known the history of Heber, you know, um, you know that this was sort of became the symbol of the line. But it, this very well had Tooele, had things gone differently, this could very well have been Tooele Valley 11 up in Heber instead of 618. Um, here's some pictures from those final years in the 60s and 70s of the line's operation. Um, here's number 100. Um, you can see the high railer. We actually have this high railer in the museum still, but this old 
pickup truck with just a little train wheels right there. Um, here it is. So this is Main Street. This is the main thoroughfare through town, and that's Vine Street that the train's going down on. Um, you can see the Great Salt Lake, where the Western Pacific Main Line is way off in the distance. Um, so traffic really began dropping off on the Tour Valley. The smelter was less profitable. It was old. They weren't really upgrading the equipment. There had been a few strikes in the 60s, which slowed down production and dropped things off for a few years. So sort of the death knell for the smelter was in the 1970s, and it happened on the other side of the world. In the, um, Chile, in South America, they elected a socialist president named, named Salvador Allende. Now, Salvador, as a socialist, he went and he seized all the mines. He nationalized everything, which included Anaconda's copper mines that they had in Chile, which were sort of the big, profitable mines that were keeping the company afloat. So Anaconda lost these mines in Chile when the government seized them. And with that, Anaconda had to cut the fat. They had to trim down and make things more operational. And the Tuila smelter was the first thing on the chopping block. It was an old facility. It hadn't been really kept up to modern specs. And it wasn't really making much of a profit anymore. Um, before I go on to the next slide, though, I got to point out this picture I got. This is, a, this is like the ultimate like, merger look, train here, because you have a um, Western Pacific 207, a Rio Grande engine behind it, and a Union Pacific caboose on the end. <laughs> so like, there you go, that's the entire history of like, everything went from Western Pacific to UP right there on that one train. Um, and that's somewhere on the Warner Branch Line coming into Tooele. Um, it is, I should note the Warner Branch Line, the Tooele Army Depot in the 1940s was built on the, branch, on the end of the branch line. So after, even after the smelter closed down, the Western Pacific was still doing traffic with the Army base. So January 1972 was when the smelter shut down. Number 100 was transferred up to Butte. Um, kind of poetic considering how many of the original Tool Valley locomotives were secondhand from Butte that the only original Tool Valley locomotive would end up going secondhand up to Butte itself. <laughs> Um, Tooele Valley really cut down its schedule to bi-weekly, so you'd only see two, maybe three if you were lucky, trains a week. Um, the Historic American Engineering Record, a uh, government like record keeping thing, they came in and they took some pictures of the smelter right before demolition started. Sort of, and it's kind of cool that they're able to grab these pictures. They're on the Library of Congress website if you want to check them out for yourself. Um, you can see the casting floors from the smelter all sort of abandoned and just almost about for demolition. This is the ore bin. So this is where the ore and the coal and the flux and whatnot would come in from the railroad and they'd dump them into the bins underneath and then they'd um, transfer them to the smelter furnaces and processes. And this is number 100 here. Um, this is here in Salt Lake City on the Salt Lake and Garfield Western Railroad, just um, by North Temple to the east of us here. So they brought it up from Tooele. It sat in the yard there in um, Salt Lake for a little bit, and then they shipped it up to Montana. So the guy who was in charge of the Tool Valley Railway, the local newspaper thought the railroad would shut down with the smelter, so the guy in charge had to go to the newspaper and say, no, we're not out of business quite yet. We're going to keep running for a while longer. His name was Don H. Lee. Um, the railroad stayed in business as a common carrier. They were still running things to the team tracks, such as newsprint um, and other local goods. And also, we're doing scrap trains. So, this is our this is the Tooele Station, which is where the modern day museum site is. Um, they're kind of reshingling the roof. I, I kind of like that little detail. But this train of gondolas is all scrap coming from the smelter as they were demolishing. Um, with Anaconda, since they lost their big mines in Chile, they decided that they needed a new mining property to remain open. Like, as a company, they needed a new source of income. So they remembered how they used to own some claims up in Bingham Canyon. So on the Tooele side of the mountain, they drilled this new mine shafts that went down to the bottom of the Bingham um, ore body, and Anaconda was able to start mining down there. And they named this the Car Fork Mine, it was reactivating some of the old Highland Boy Apex Mine area. And the railway was 
you know, it had a new industry, a new customer again. So the railway would haul up machinery for the mill that they were building for the mine. The concentrator needed like steel rods to smash the ore down. And the railroad was serving, was doing that, and they kept the railway basically on standby to help serve this new project. Um, Anaconda did consider, as they were building the mine, they're like, well, once we get ore coming out of here, what we should do is build a new main line for the Tula Valley Railway to loop around the mountain, you know, so no longer runs through the middle of town and just go directly to the Union Pacific. That didn't happen. The mine got downsized. They reduced the number of shafts they were going to build, the amount of ore they expected to produce, and they used trucks instead. So after all that work helping build the mine, the Tula Valley Railway never shipped any of the ore that came out of it. Um, Atlanta, um, Anaconda in 1977 became part of the Atlantic Richfield Company. Um, the mine, after several years of construction, was officially opened in 1979. The Tula Valley was really slow and not a lot was going on. Like They didn't have customers and too much going on. So with the minimal traffic in 1980, on July 7th, the Tula Valley ran what would become its last revenue freight car. So they had this one Burlington Northern car, which was at the team track and the station. So a crew went up and picked up the freight car, and they took it down to the Western Pacific and to change at Warner. And they dropped off one freight car for the Western Pacific to take back into Salt Lake. And then the, they got, you know, they had some rail fans who came out from, they traveled all across the state to come and take pictures of it. So we have a nice picture of the final crew on this revenue train. And then here they are, running back up Fine Street through the middle of town. They they go back to the smelter site. They lock up the. They put the locomotive in the caboose in the engine house, and that was it. That was the end of revenue operations on the railroad. Although the railroad would actually continue to exist as a corporate entity for two more years. Um, Don H. Lee, let's see. I think this guy here. I want to say um, he. As superintendent of the railroad, he began sort of thinking, he's like, well, our company's about to go out of business. Maybe we need a museum to commemorate what we were doing here. So in the 1980s, the mine shut down. Atlantic Richfield Company decided it was going to basically abandon everything in Tooele. So with that, they donated the Tooele station and some of the old railroad equipment, such as the um, number 11, they went to the park, they dragged number 11 out of the park and brought it up to the station. They um, picked up, so they, they dropped off the old cabooses, the snow plow, and Union Pacific donated a boxcar or something. Um, I'm sure as Western Pacific fans will notice the date, 1982, didn't really bode well for the history of Western Pacific that year either, so there's kind of that irony that both the, both the Tool Valley and Western Pacific disappeared from history around the same time. Um, this is sort of a photo of the museum when it was first set up. You can see some of the early community members and volunteers who sort of helped um, set up the place, all sort of take, checking out the new loco the steam locomotive that had just been brought back up to the area. So yeah, after 1982, they scrapped the railroad, everything shut down, but I think I like, I like to think that the legacy of the railroad continues with what is being done at the museum today. I have some pictures, um, sort of, of what it looks like out here at the museum. Um, this is an early photo of the little, like, seven and a half inch gauge track that was set up around the line. Um, Marion Bevan, the guy who was stuck in the snow in that picture earlier, ended up becoming a volunteer. <laughs> who until his death would be one of the guys who helped out the museum. Um, the Warner Branch, which the Western Pacific built to reach Tooele after the Union Pacific merger became redundant. So ultimately, the Warner Branch would be mothballed and demolished over the years. Currently, there's a small section of it which goes down from the, the main line a couple of miles, which they occasionally use to store cars on. But the majority of the track south of that has been removed and you can't really see much evidence of the Western Pacific in Tooele City anymore. Um, of course the Union Pacific Main Line is still very busy as part of the line that comes out of Los Angeles and goes east. Um, during this time the museum was staffed by a lot of the people who used to work for Car Fork, the smelter, or the railroad. 
1984, our museum, the museum was registered as part of the National Historic Register of Historic Places. I included a name of some of the people who and groups that have been involved in the museum during the years. Um, our, one of the, you know, we have the Trackers Model Railroad Club. If you've been seeing their booth, they've been out there in the presentation room during this um, convention running the museum's booth for us. And um, Jean Modis, she was one of the people who was running, she was the museum director for the majority of my life, and she just um, retired, but, you know, she, she, was one, she's the peop, she was one of the people I remember going to the museum as a kid, being there, because she's been there pretty much as long as I've been going. <laughs> um, here's just a few shots from around the museum, the back head of number 11. Um, one of our major projects that as a city we are working on right now is we had to demolish the wooden dock which surrounded the museum because it was crumbling and it was unstable. And that's kind of one of our major projects right now is we're trying to get the funding to rebuild that and get everything back open again. Um, our normal museum schedule is Memorial Day through Labor Day, um, Tuesday through Saturday, 1 to 4 p.m. Um, with that, as I said, since we are working on the dock rebuild, we're still kind of waiting to see um, when the museum is going to reopen this year, but we'll keep an eye on that. And you can, we'll probably mention it on Facebook when it comes out, when we get everything set up again. The bridge that I showed you earlier in the presentation still stands in Tooele City, right next to the golf course. So if you like golfing and trains, well, you can go play a, a round of links right here. And look up at the bridge here. And, and they have these little like grass box there. I, I, I've always wondered if they're like tea boxes. I've never seen anyone like tee off from the bridge. But if you try, like I'm not. I don't know if the, the golf course has any rules against it. But if you want to, you can see if you can tee off of the railroad bridge right there. <laughs> um, Atlantic Richfield Company. They set up a wildlife preserve. Um, as you can imagine, smelter leaves an ecological mess. So it was a super fun site. The EPA went in there. It's currently unlisted on the Superfund site, so yeah, most of it's pretty much cleaned up now. Um, so they found, though, this wildlife preserve. So you can go up, this is the smelter, where the smelter used to be, and the train tracks used to come around this grade, right here, going down there, da -da -da -da, off into town. So if any of you like hiking, you can come out to Tooele, visit our museum, and then go up into the mountains and walk all around the smelter site and sort of get a good lay of the land where everything used to be. So yeah, with that, I'm going to just show off. I have sort of my brief bibliography stuff from some of the people who helped contribute to this pres um, presentation. Okay, real quick. Yes. You mentioned Facebook. We do have a page called the Friends of the Twelve Dollar Girl Road on Facebook, and that's where we're telling all this stuff to be updated. Yeah, yeah, I mean, mostly Kevin and I, we both sort of contribute to the Facebook page. So we're, we're going to help keep things updated and let you guys know. And we'd love to see you guys come out if you're ever in Utah again during the summer and stop by and visit us. Because, you know, we think we, we have a, it's a pretty, un, we are, I think we're a bit of a treasure that is often forgotten in the railroad scene. And we love having people come out and learn more about what we do out here. Um, does anyone have any questions for me? Like, just any comments or anything more you'd want to ask before we finish up? Jacob, yeah. um, there's still some aerial towers there, like down yes. towards Stansbury Park and stuff, uh -huh. going up the mountain. Uh -huh. Where did that go to, and what was it? What was it connected to? That wasn't actually built for mining. That was built to get to the Farnsworth Peak um, television antennas. Oh, well, so they were constructing that. Yeah, yeah. So and then when they were operating it, so what they used to do is the workers who worked up at the television antennas on Farnsworth Peak would ride that cable car up from Lake Point and Sandsbury up to the top of the mountain. And I think after they had an accident or something on that line, so they removed it and they go up there by helicopter like ATV. Okay. But yeah, so yeah, those radio towers you see out there on the edge of the mountain were what that um, tram went up to. Thank you. All right. I, I don't know if you mentioned this, but do either of the diesels still exist? Uh, yes. To my knowledge, the number 100 was last seen. It was bought by the SNS um, Shortline Company, which is based in Farmington. Um, 
Um, last I saw, it was sent to Silver Bow, Montana, to the Port of Montana. So it is still up in the Butte, Anaconda, Montana area. Um, the number 104, the one that was the X Pickering Lumber, last I heard, it was in Columbus, Nebraska, I want to say, like at an ADM plant there. Big, like, ethanol plant. Um, not really a place that's publicly accessible, so I've never really seen pictures of it. I don't know if it is still there, but that's where I last heard it was. We do actually have a wheel set from the old tram uh -huh. road on the Kennecott side on the property now, too, that was dug out of a slag pile over <laughs> in Kennecott. And uh, one of our members happened to work up there and said, hey, can I have that? So we got some interesting artifacts out there. So yeah. Um, any other questions or comments? Or? All right.